have spent this year looking for lead in schools. Um, we've had a lead and copper rule that's been in existence for the last 20, 25 years. But that particular rule has focused on identifying waters that are corrosive. It's not really focused on protecting public health. So there really have been gaps in the data that we've been able to accumulate over that last 25 years on what occurrence is going on where our vulnerable population is. And lead impacts developing bodies much more heavily than it does adult bodies and so children are our at-risk population. So as an aftermath of Flint, when people started to recognize that lead can be in the drinking water even if the drinking water that's provided to that facility might be totally lead free, um, we started to recognize those gaps in the regulatory framework. So in Utah, we decided that as opposed to just assuming that everything was fine, that we would go look. As DEQ, we went out and requested that school districts voluntarily take the samples, recognizing that they didn't have a budget in place for that and that there would be some technical challenges for them to collect those samples. We have laid in place ways for them to get financing to help collect those samples. We gave them technical support on how to take the samples, where to take the samples from, and we have built a website and a repository for all of the data that we've made available to the public so anybody throughout the state can get on to leadinwater.utah.gov and look up the specific school that their child is attending and see what the results of that sampling were. We've been super happy with how many school districts have chosen to participate in this volunteer initiative. We haven't gotten everybody. Uh, we have probably 80% of all of the school districts and that is translated to about 60% of all of the schools that have been sampled statewide. And we have ha found a handful of schools that had particularly high levels of lead. So the water coming to the school wasn't necessarily high, but school buildings tend to be large and water can pick up lead from galvanized pipes or from solder of copper pipes. It can also pick up lead from brass um, faucets and fixtures in the school. And we found about 20 schools that have particularly high levels of lead above what the action limit is. And yet those schools have taken that action and remediated that and have been able to get those samples low. So we feel like this has been a really successful program. We've been able to find pockets of exposure that are easily mitigated and to reduce the exposure of our children throughout the state. We've still got pockets of schools that have not sampled, but we've received approximately 1,200 samples statewide. Most of those were taken throughout this year. Some of the school districts recognized that this might have been a problem and they actually preemptively sampled prior to us approaching them. Of those 1,200 samples, 90% um, of the schools actually showed detectable levels of lead, but probably half of those have been trace levels of lead. And half of them have been somewhere above trace, but not to the point of the action limit. And we've had 20 or so schools that were high enough that we encouraged the schools to take mitigation actions. And all of the schools that received high samples, their school districts were on top of it, willing, um, prepared to go in and make those remediation efforts. And those have been relatively inexpensive mediation efforts, changing out a faucet, flushing the pipes, um, making sure that there aren't drinking fountains that um, have stagnant water to them. And so with very little effort and a little bit of going out and looking for it, I've, we've been able to reduce the exposure to the children. Now that we've found that there is potential for higher exposure at the schools than what the water systems are delivering, uh, we'll put together a task force of stakeholders and, and we'll look into where we want to go from here.